Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Uh, our guest today is Kieran Setia, author of Life is Hard, How Philosophy Can Help Us Find Our Way. Published by Riverhead, it'll be released on October 4th. Karen teaches philosophy at MIT and works in ethics and the philosophy of mind. He's authored Practical Knowledge, Reasons Without Rationalism and Knowing Right from Wrong. His last book was Midlife, A Philosophical Guide. His work has been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Economist, amongst many other periodicals. He's also written about Baseball, Dave Chappelle, we could talk about that because I disagree with some of his things, and the meaning of life. <clears throat> Speaking of which, his lecture on argument also is somewhat Python-esque. Uh, <laughs> life is hard. Ask a Buddhist. Life is suffering. Not necessarily the best translation, but close enough. Ask the guy who wrote the book, uh, The Road Less Traveled, one of my least favorite books. He says in his first line, life is difficult. This is a great truth, one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth because once we truly see this truth, a lot of truths, we transcend it. And once we truly know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. And then we may parse that a little bit with regard to the book that Kieran's written. So yeah, we can argue that. And as he talks about with Python, an argument is a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition. Argument is an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic gainsaying, my favorite word, of anything the other person says. Uh, so we can do that till Kieran says, um, as uh, Michael Palin says, I've had enough of this. And uh, John Cleese replied, no, you haven't. Uh, <laughs> so Kieran starts off with life, friends, is hard. And some of our friends along the way that he brings to the show are Aquinas, Aristotle, Virginia Woolf, Emily Dickinson, P.D. James, Descartes, Sartre, especially nausea, which really, really figures in for me. Um, so anyway, Karen, let's start off with you and your friends as well. Welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Sam. It's great to be here. So as a bookseller, as we talked about briefly before, um, I'm interested because my customers are and they do judge books by its cover. Um, let's talk about the cover because at first you might look at it as, oh, this book is about flowers is botany <laughs> and then you realize I that can, the, well i was gonna yeah, say i can i can show people i have a i have a, an event oh yeah please so people people can see the cover there it is that's the yeah. the image yeah it's a great cover and um i think what it is is it's really showing that you can get past things because there's thorns and bristles and then you can get to the actual nectar is that kind of what it That's is? That's the idea. It was a very, it's an interesting uh, path to this cover. So it, it was very hard to come up with a cover that image that really captured the book because there were lots that were very solemn. There was one cover that was very, very beautiful. That was, you know, the, the Japanese Kintsugi idea where you have broken pottery and then you repair it with gold and it's very, and it was very beautiful, but it was a little, uh, yeah, solemn feeling. And this book is not really solemn. There are jokes in it. It's a little playful. It's not, I hope, depressing. And so we wanted somehow to convey that there's a, a way to find the sweetness in life with the, the hummingbird and the thistle that doesn't involve denying that it's hard. It's, you know, the hummingbird is sort of hovering, uncertain how to deal with the thistle, but uh, it's going to figure it out. Yeah. And you talk later in the book about hope, but you also talk about, um, the, the difficulty in this hummingbird's quest and failure is an option. So, and then moving on again, uh, because of uh, an occup occupational hazard for me, I like talking about, oh, the title. Um, so Life is Hard, We just, I discussed that in the introduction. Um, the subtitles, which generally I don't particularly like, but this subtitle, um, talk about how that arose and why you felt that you needed that in addition to the title itself. Well, I wanted people to know that it's a book that uses philosophy. And again, there was this kind of challenge in trying to describe it because there's lots of uh, kind of subtitles that people go for with kind of philosophical books about how to live that are of the form, how philosophy can, you know, 
make your life perfect, you know, how philosophy can solve your problems. And I want to help people with their problems. And I think philosophy is useful in approaching and taking, sort of acknowledging that life is hard and figuring out how to live well despite that. But that I wanted to have a way of expressing that philosophy can help that didn't make it seem like a magic cure. And I also love this metaphor of the map, the idea of sort of giving of a kind of guidebook or a, a kind of uh, map to rough terrain, the sense that what we're going to do is we, we're not going to deny that the landscape of life is challenging, but we could kind of sort of wend our way through it. And, and that's sort of the other idea that I think the title picks up on. Yeah, and you do that well in the introduction, which is kind of a lengthy introduction, but well worth it because once again, just like I said before about a jigsaw puzzle, the introduction kind of is the cover and then you get to the actual pieces and putting them together. Yes, yeah. I mean, so that it's it's a book that is in a way not quite episodic. It has a kind of narrative arc from sort of personal trauma through to kind of larger issues about society and our relation, kind of spirituality and our relationship to the the universe. But it, it, it's sort of you. It's a book you could dip in and out of. So it's a there are chapters on infirmity, uh, loneliness, grief, failure, injustice, the absurdity of life, and so. Yeah, the introduction sort of gives you a, a, a picture of what the project is. And then I try to take up particular hardships that people face in their lives and say something philosophically meaningful about them. And the one that I said um, that's important to me, maybe not so much as uh, to my customers, but the erudite ones, yes, is the epigraph, because I always feel as if the author must have spent time searching or remembering an epigraph in this case it's Wittgenstein and uh it's to his sister yeah uh, Hermione so uh, since you have the book there I think it's I, worth just reading I, it I can read it yeah so uh it's a it, I mean the context is that she had written to him puzzled about his bizarre decision to give up philosophy and become a school teacher and said you know you you becoming a school teacher just makes no sense at all and he he wrote back to her you remind me of someone who's looking through a closed window and cannot explain to himself the strange movements of a passerby. He doesn't know what storm is raging out there or that this person might only with difficulty be keeping himself on his feet. And I've, I've always loved this. I mean, I've loved this from the first time I read it years and years and years ago. And I've loved it in part because I, I think it's, it's something I've needed to learn slowly uh, myself and that uh, it came much more easily in the first person than the third. So to think, you don't to think about other people who were being mean to me uh, or weren't being nice enough to me. You don't know what I'm going through. And then th that came quickly. And the, the shift of realizing that I don't know what they're going through either took a lot longer and was a kind of s slow process of growing up for me. So I think it it captures something about the connection between suffering and compassion that is very much behind why I wanted to write a book about how to live that really never loses touch with the fact that life is hard. It's not that I, I wanna be depressing, it's that I, I think that that's sort of the, the compassionate way to think about your own life and other people's. The thing that it reminded me of, simply, I guess initially because of the glass was uh, Corinthians and Paul and uh, through a glass darkly. Yeah. Right. Is, is that kind of the obverse? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I know why I thought it. And, and through a glass darkly is simply the idea that here in this life, things are obscured. But at some point, at least from the biblical perspective, we're going to be able to see everything. Here you have a man who says, I have no idea what that other guy's going through. I have no idea what, even what he's thinking. Yeah. And I mean, the biblical idea also has a kind of promise of consolation, even if you don't understand what it is. So it doesn't tell you, here's why it's all going to be okay. But it, there's some kind of assurance that in a way you can't yet grasp, uh, you know, there's a reason for everything, the sufferings of life will somehow be vindicated. And it is true that p part of my premise in sort of approaching the difficulties of life was that we, we can't assume that we can't assume a, a kind of like what philosophers call a theodicy, a kind of story about how we fit into the world on which God is going to make sure that everything is fine in the end. And we have to sort of not lose touch with the fact that, that things are difficult. I was going to mention that you also taught epistemology, but I was afraid I couldn't pronounce it. So I didn't say it. No, no, you got it right. You got it right. Yeah. Oh, uh, 
but and I only say this because you brought it up first, but I'll tell you solipsism. So uh -huh. everybody I interview, and there's tons of them, neuroscience, philosophy, and metaphysics, all like to discuss their bailiwick, which is a seat of human consciousness, whether it's based on neurons, whether it's based on God, whether it's based on some type of psychology. You know, you talk about uploading, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So suppose this. First of all, you can't disprove that this is a solipsistic universe. That's the first thing. And second of all, it means that only one of us is talking. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, the question I always ask them, they get mad because this screws up their entire theory, obviously. Yeah. But my, my question is, if it was a solipsistic universe, do you think you would act any differently than you've acted thus far in your lifetime? Well, if I really knew that none of the people I thought I'd hurt really existed and they weren't really hurt, I, I there will be a certain relief in that. And then if I realized, to my horror, that all the people I love were, were didn't re didn't really exist and were just sort of, you know, ideations of my own mind, I think that would be terrible. That would be on the other side terrible. So I do think there's a there's a this is one place in which a contrast that I think is important to approaching life's hardships comes into view, which is the contrast between how one feels about life, sort of whether you feel happy or not, and whether you're actually living well, because in a solipsistic, you know, setup, if you don't realize that nothing around you is real, you might feel great, but you're not actually living the kind of life you want to be living at all. And what matters to us and what should matter to us in the end, is to actually you know, make contact with reality and make contact with other people not just to be happy, which doesn't mean that happiness doesn't matter. It's just that it's not, you know, the only thing that matters, assuming that solipsism isn't true. I mean, if solipsism is true, then, then it is just me and there isn't anything else to make contact with. And I, I'm going to have to come to terms with that. But uh, or, or I'm, just I'm hoping me. that isn't true. <laughs> Sorry. Or yeah. me. I, it yeah. can be me. Or just you. Or, well, uh, let me tell you, I, I know for sure it's not just you. But uh. <laughs> well, that goes into two things that segue nicely is your arguments with regard to Descartes and also this concept, the chapter regarding loneliness and solitude. If you did realize that you were it, you'd be totally lost on this strand of darkness where you would never have any human contact. And that would be maybe the ultimate pain. Yeah. I mean, I, so I think, it's very tempting, especially if you're a philosopher, when you're thinking about human loneliness, to start from sort of these metaphysical questions about solipsism and think, well, you know, Descartes famously says, I think, therefore I am, and that I can't, it, it's the challenge is to prove the existence of anyone else, or in fact, of any external world at all. And then, you know, he proves the existence of God, and it all turns out fine. But if you don't think his arguments work, uh, there's a sort of subsequent history of philosophers like, uh, Hegel is one, your, your uh, hero, maybe, or your, the, the, you know, Sartre is another, and uh, um, uh, Camus is another. And so philosophers who are trying to argue that there's a way in which our own self-consciousness, like our sense of ourselves, is dependent on our relation to other people. And I think there's real insight in that. Although in the end, I don't think that kind of approach really gets to the bottom of the problem of loneliness, partly because I think, you know, you know, arguing that loneliness is terrible because if there aren't other people around, you can't be, you know, you couldn't be conscious of yourself is in its way itself sort of solipsistic or narcissistic. It's like saying, you know, the terrible thing about loneliness has nothing to do with actually with connecting with other people. It's that I need them for something that I, I want, namely my own self-awareness. And I, so I think that doesn't quite get to the bottom. I think that really to, to sort of make sense of loneliness, you have to take this other perspective, and this maybe connects back to my resistance to sort of Descartes and the idea of you know, minds separate from bodies. I think the perspective that really helps to make sense of loneliness and its difficulties for us begins with the fact that we're embodied beings, that we are a certain kind of animal and that we're social animals and that our, we have a kind of need for friends that's part of you know, how human life and uh, human interaction is sort of constituted. And it's that sort of less metaphysical or at least less uh, highfalutin kind of um, approach that, that I think gives us a better sense of what the problem of loneliness is. And really, it, the problem is people need friends, like people need to have companions. 
and you know thinking about loneliness is really a, a kind of negative way into the positive topic of friendship and the value of friendship and you know why it matters that we have friends at all hey when i look down i'm writing i'm taking notes i'm not like oh sure yeah 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 me too me too <laughs> <laughs> well the thing about the cart where he tries to get himself off the hook is when he just ends up at god and said god would never do this to us no exactly exactly i mean so that's the funny thing he starts out by saying i'm you know i want to i I know that I exist. How can I prove that anyone else exists? And the first thing he goes for is, is not, you know, that you exist. It's not like me trying to prove that you exist when I'm talking to you. He goes immediately for, you know, what might seem like overkill. It proves the existence of God and says, well, God wouldn't deceive us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't call it the opposite of solipsism, but since you and I have both mentioned Sartre, and you talk about nausea and you talk about the trees, um, so when I read that, I was in uh, college and I was in an altered state of consciousness. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> so when I read about the trees, I could go by an oak tree and I could feel it radiating its essence to me, just its oakness. And um, it's too much. It just how, how he was. It's just, it's just too much stuff. There's too much coming in. And, and it does make you, the idea of nausea makes sense because, and you talk, you amplify on that because you talk about it towards the end yeah yeah no absolutely there's this i mean i i had this experience too so there's a, this amazing image in, in in nausea where uh the protagonist is yeah, looking at a tree trunk and is just sort of overwhelmed by the fact that it, it exists and exists in all this detail like there's so much to it and you know the more you look the more there is to it and it's and it, 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 i think the the, the line is like it that the tree trunks or the, the the roots didn't want to exist, but they just couldn't help it. They were sort of overflowing. And I had had, when I first read that, I was kind of amazed because I remember having uh, the same experience myself when I was like in seven or eight or something in the playground. I remember looking at things and I remember it was a tree trunk thinking, why is that even here? Like it, it, it doesn't have to be, it could just go. And then, then I thought like it could go now. What's stopping it and in some sense the answer is well the laws of physics or whatever but what's stopping them from changing what well, at a certain point there's this sense of just the sheer contingency of the existence of everything and yeah i found that very alarming and it, it i think that was one of the things that ended up making me become a philosopher and sort of keep, want to keep thinking about those kinds of questions yeah and it's funny because at the age of seven you wrote your first poem and what i what caught me about that was how does a seven-year-old kid know what desolation is? How? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, how, what did it mean to you as opposed to what it means? That is a good question. I don't really remember very well. I do remember, I think, you know, I, I suspect, now this is going to make it seem less cool. It sounds very highbrow, like seven-year-old kid prodigy writing a poem yeah. about desolation. I suspect that the thing in my mind was Star Wars. So I was a huge Star Wars fan and I watched Star Wars first at like six or seven. And I suspect that the thing that the play, the empty desolate playground reminded me of was uh, Luke Skywalker looking out over Tatooine, over the, the sort of vast desert. So I, I suspect that's the kind of association it might've had for me. But the truth is I don't really remember very well. I just sort of have this sort of sense memory of the, of this, the feeling that the playground was just barren and that I was I was sort of alone in the world and yeah that I, I wrote it down at the time and uh yeah I I you know I, I toyed with poetry for a while after that I had my teenage poetry writing phase but thankfully most of it I I haven't kept or the bits I have kept I keep very quiet yeah I remember when I was like three or four <clears throat> everyone was telling me about God so I just was thinking I was sitting there thinking and I go okay God if you exist do this uh -huh. and then he, he didn't do it and i said oh okay well i guess they're all wrong uh -huh. <laughs> he didn't do it and that's isn't that the, what he's supposed to be there for? he challenged god yeah exactly why, why didn't what is the bertrand russell quote is that if, if he met god at the what if he met god in heaven what would he ask him and, and russell said why didn't you give us more evidence <laughs> which or, or it's like uh, Pascal's wager, you know, I, I should just continue to believe in him because there's no downside, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a chance it will work out, yeah. So the other thing you talk about 
when you were about that age and as you got older, and then you can talk a little bit about how alone you felt or still may feel. Um, you said philosophy was an escape from ordinary life. Yeah, it, yes, that was definitely my initial attraction to it was not. So what I write, what I write about now in midlife and in this book is an attempt to sort of bring philosophical reflection into contact with ordinary life to say, what, what are the conversations I'm actually having with friends about how to live? And they're about things like grief or failure or the midlife crisis. But that's a kind of late turn for me. I think the th questions that initially attracted me to philosophy were these sort of very abstract ones about absurdity or the why is there something rather than nothing or the existence of God. And it was a kind of escape. It felt like this was a, a kind of, in a way, it's a substitute for for certain aspects of religion that, that there was a kind of other world it felt like of questions that were not at all mundane and gave me this sort of transcend transcendent dimension to my life just to be able to think about them and yeah that that was the, and remains part of my attraction to philosophy and something i really love about philosophy even though it feels now that i'm you know in my later 40s or entering my late 40s it feels like the time has come to to sort of reconnect these philosophical reflections with you know mortality and and the, the difficulties of life don't talk about mortality to someone who's 70 years old okay we'll, we'll, we'll keep away from that that topic for now that's like saying you're gaining weight when you're standing next to someone who weighs 350 pounds well it could hit death could hit any of us at any time but i appreciate that uh that i that there are perspectives on this that i i don't have yet and i hope i <laughs> I, li I live long enough to get so well, the worst one is if you walk up to a woman and ask her when she's due and she's not pregnant. That's, I did that once. And then I realized it's much better to walk up and say, how about this weather? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like wet weather is safe. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. You know, you know it's, it's funny that, well, well, I guess explain why, like with regard to your chronic pain, with regard to your, not aloofness, but your not wanting to speak in front of in, with individuals, but you're calmer when yeah. you're speaking to the assembly of people. Like in this instance, it, do you feel that in this instance? And talk about why. I, yeah. Go ahead. Well, so we could start with, I mean, so we can come back to chronic pain because that was another, I mean, part of how I got into writing about hardship in life was, was that I was, di diagnosed is not the right word. I started to have a chronic pain condition when I was 27. I'm not sure it's ever really been diagnosed except, you know, here are some terms to describe it. But um, but loneliness, I think we can maybe come back to that. I mean, in the case of loneliness, I actually think one thing I like about I, so during the pandemic, like er, every other person on earth, I started a podcast and, uh, that was, it was really good for me to, to have this sort of outlet for social interaction. And I thought, you know, one thing I really love about the, that kind of podcast format, the in interviewing other people was that I'm paying attention to someone else. I'm not actually thinking about myself. And it's partly structured. Like there's a sense, so my, my podcast is called Five Questions. And so when the conversation gets awkward, the worst case scenario is I say, moving on to question two. And there's just like, there, there's the capacity for awkward silence is minimal. And so I think there is those kinds of conversations I think are quite powerful in addressing loneliness. And I think they're, they tell you something about the nature of loneliness and the, and the kind of human desire for social contact, which is, although what we often want and think we want is sort of deep friendship and there are amazing rewards to deep friendship it's kind of surprising how much just spending i would like record for 30 minutes talking to 30 minutes paying attention to someone else even though there was no friendship that was going to come of this i wasn't really going to talk to them again it wasn't sort of the beginning of anything nevertheless that kind of mutual attention and recognition really is already doing something to address the kind of feelings of loneliness that were that were um a lot of us were hit with in, in an especially intense way during the pandemic and there's a kind of philosophical story about that but there's also a lot of social science that suggests this is really true that actually even small sort of episodes of paying attention to someone and having them pay attention to you especially with a little bit of a script so that you don't you're not sort of don't have social anxiety so much actually really does a lot to start to begin to help people get over uh, the kind of habits of loneliness that can be sort of, you know, so self-reinforcing. 
Yeah, it's funny. After my interviews, I always feel like, oh, let's go get a drink. Yeah. <laughs> I already feel that way. Yes, let's go get a drink and talk about stuff. But, you know, you ask these questions and, you know, you ask them, they're hard questions. So let me ask you one. Do so, you honestly believe in all of these philosophical arguments that you make? You ask that of philosophers. I do ask that of philosophers. I, that is a very good and very difficult question. And your I, question, and then you do it in order to get them, <laughs> them on the spot. No, no, exactly. I put them on the spot. I mean, I, I think there are, there's a lot of what I do as a philosopher that I'm not sure whether I believe it or whether my attitude to it is something more like we're dealing with very hard questions. And if I had to bet whether, which, what direction the truth lies in, I, this is where I'd place my bet that, you know, th this is the way to think about friendship or something that I, I think is, is the right way to go. I, I think it's more likely to be right than any of the other ways of thinking about it, but am I confident that it's right? And not necessarily. And am I sure about the details? Usually not. So the, this book is is sort of written for the general reader. If you if you read academic philosophers, often what you find is, is a lot of intricacy in working out developed theories. And I think there's great value in sort of trying to figure out all the intricate details of your understanding of justice or human well-being or something. But my sense of those kinds of academic projects is the ch what you should your attitude to them should be something like the chances of me being right at the level of detail are tiny. If I'm right about anything, it's going to be the general direction of this train of thought, not the, the kind of precise details. And I suppose at the, at the level of general direction, I do stand by the kinds of claims I make in the book, whether the details are exactly right, or even if I could spell out all the little nitty gritty details in a way that my professional colleagues would, would want me to, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Well, if you drill down, you know, you talk about uh, the buildings where you teach and how you're ensconced in this, not an ivory tower, but you know what I mean. Yeah, and yeah. Then, but then you also say a society that won't support the study of questions about reality and our place in it uh, is profoundly impo impoverished. And as far as I can see, we don't ponder any of those things. You and I might. Our society does not do that. Well, it's I, so a thing that's happened in the last maybe 10 years in philosophy, which I think is really great, is that I, I think there has been uh, the causes of it are not great. The causes uh, are to do with the fact that higher education is under financial duress. But I think there is a, a sense in which a lot of people like me in academia, philosophers who work uh, often on more abstruse questions than the ones I work on, have thought a lot more than they used to about how to actually communicate with a wider audience. And so I think it is starting to happen. Like, I think that, that there's lots of people who are asking questions like the question you asked it for, like, God, why don't you prove yourself? You prove, if you exist, why don't you prove it to me? Why, why are you hiding? People ask these questions in their own lives, often very deep philosophical questions. And the challenge is to sort of connect people's instinct to ask those questions, keep it kind of keep that flame alive, and then connect it with the kinds of things that are happening in higher education. So I think I, I do feel very grateful to live at a time in which there is in effect support for philosophers to think about these questions. There are philosophy departments at the University of Pittsburgh, where I used to be and MIT, where I am now, in which people are thinking about these questions. And then there's people out there who, uh, probably would be interested in them if only we could communicate with them. And I think that's a kind of task that philosophers are now starting to take up and other, other academics take up, take up that task more seriously of figuring out how to communicate with the, all the people who might be interested. And, and maybe not everyone is interested, but I think it's not just you and me. I think there's a real kind of fascination for philosophical questions. People want to think about them. And yeah, they, the question is, how do you make that possible? How do you make those kinds of connections real. And the problem I see with that is that we are both lucky enough and shouldn't take for granted the fact that we are able to do that. Um, right. You talk about how lucky you are in terms of your family, your work, um, the fact that we don't have to, we're not hungry. Right. But if you tell someone in the Ukraine or in Afghanistan or Martha's Vineyard for that matter right now, hey, let's talk about the meaning of life or why we're, they don't have time. They don't have time to do it.
I mean, I think there's truth in this. And then I also think there's, you know, often when you think about kind of these deep questions about like the, the meaning of existence and what is it all about, they are questions that people ask sort of in the midst of war or in the midst of, of great hardship. And the, 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 there are perspectives on them that you have access to when you're dealing with difficulties and adversities much graver than any I've dealt with that I think it would be one it, it should be part of the conversation and I think you know it, a, an example of this that that sort of um part of the outreach that's happening in a lot of academic departments is sort of prison teaching so a lot of people are, are now doing outreach in which they teach like a class on Shakespeare in a prison and part of you know the I mean the circumstances are different in that when you're in prison, you may have time. It's just you don't have access to resources. But that's another case where I think there's a there's a kind of desire, at least among a certain kind of audience, to to think about humanistic questions or philosophical questions, and that we aren't uh, we could do more to to meet that desire. Although I think it, it, people are trying to do it. I think you're also right that there's there are circumstances of such urgency that. This seems sort of, um, it seems like it's sort of idle. But even then, you know, when I try to think, sometimes philosophers will, will sort of feel guilty about asking uh, um, these sort of abstract questions about the nature of existence. Like, well, you know, do numbers exist? Why am I wasting my time on this? And I think it's true that there are more urgent problems. But if you imagine that no one ever thought about these questions, if somehow, the, if you imagine a future in which no one really thinks about uh, questions about the nature of mathematics or questions about how how language gets meaning or kind of abstract philosophical questions, that would be in its way as dystopian a future as a future in which there's no more music or people don't, you know, go to the theater. Like there isn't, or there isn't stand-up comedy or, you know, Dave Chappelle and his uh, elk are no longer out there entertaining us. And, um, so I do think that there's a way in which you've got to balance the, the sense of urgency with a sense of what kind of future we want to be possible. And that, you know, in the further future, and some of that has to involve the survival of sort of things of cultural value, like, like all the books behind you, some of which are about urgent things and many of which are, are, are probably not. Still disagree with you because it's like if we go back to Buddhism, you know, the idea is the reason why suffering exists is because we don't let go. And um, Chang Yong Trump, uh, Shambhala, um, Buddhist, you know, he talked about, you know, jumping out of a plane in a parachute and then taking the scissors and just cutting a line. Uh -huh. So these things are the easiest things to do in the world, but they're also the hardest things to do in the world. And unless the, the Ukrainians that we're speaking of are bodhisattvas, I can't see how they can spend, I mean, intrinsically, they may ask the question, but I guess if your book is kind of a self-help book, which we, you joke about, um, I don't know how that book can help them at those moments in their lives. But we don't need to belabor that, but that's just how I feel. No, no. I mean, I, I, I agree that, that people are in a circumstance in which they don't have the time or leisure to read a book, then a book is not going to be able to help them. And I and I think there are circumstances like that. I guess the two things I wanted to say were that I, I, I think it would be, there's a real danger in, not in the case that you're describing, but there's a kind of bro broader danger of, of underestimating people's desire for intellectual stimulation or ability to engage with the philosophical questions. There's a kind of uh, elitism I really want to resist where we sort of think, uh, you know, th these are questions only for the rarefied, you know, few in, you know, the ivory tower. And I think that the audience for philosophy is much broader than that. And the other is this question of guilt, where it, the question is less about whether people in severe duress have the time and energy to engage with philosophical questions and more whether I should feel or whether, whether you know, we should feel like it's somehow in, you know, self-indulgent to be thinking about these questions when there are kind of urgent political problems to face. And I do, I, we can't ignore those urgent political problems, but it, I think there's, there is a kind of social um, uh, responsibility to preserve culture too, as well as to, to deal with sort of immediate needs. And so even if there isn't, even if it's not of direct use to everyone, keeping philosophy or you know the arts alive 
is a kind of contribution to a human future that we can really, you know, hope for. That makes sense. In the introduction too, you talk about you talk about self indulgence, right? And you say, I think the last thing you say maybe, I hope I don't do that. Remember you yeah. said. You know, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm conscious of the, there's, there's a, a danger in writing about these topics, which I think is the danger we're sort of a, a danger we're, we're talking around now, which is if you try to talk about the ways in which life is hard in a way that's engaged. So one option is do it in this very abstract way in which it's not personal at all. There's no real contact with reality that has its own set of problems. If you try to do it in a way that's engaged, you always run up against the fact that your own experience is limited and partial and there are things you understand and things you don't. So, you know, chronic pain, I have experience of disability, I don't. Grief, I, you know, my relationship to grief is complicated. My parents are both alive. I didn't really know my grandparents. I haven't, no one really close to me has died. On the other hand, my mother has Alzheimer's. And so there's a sort of, you know, a kind of grieving for her as she was while she's still alive. But my experience of that is all quite idiosyncratic. And so there's this challenge when you're trying to write about something like grief philosophically of putting together the, your own experience with philosophical reflection in a way that acknowledges that it's partial and people have to sort of triangulate for themselves, how much of this rings true for them and, and how it fits together, if at all, with their own experience of, of say, grief. You know, you talk about idiosyncratic and a lot of your personal life. And this is going to sound mean, but like I did a word search because you can on Kindle and use the word should 126 times in the book. And that's not really fair because a lot of it's interior to quotes of philosophers that you're, you're bringing into the book. I don't like, because I don't like that because for example, when you talk about uh, Johnson's sensitive account of meeting Singer, you say everyone should read it. And I go, no, no, everyone shouldn't read it. It should implies an obligation or duty. I, I'm saying to you, don't tell me that. And you do it like a lot. So like Peter Singer, as Johnson said, is, is one of the world's most foremost philosophers. He's done an enormous amount of work in saving animals. He's a moral philosopher. He teaches at Princeton. He specializes in applied ethics. He donates to help the global poor. He was named the American Humanist of the Year. And the idea of being able to abort a woman being able to abort her fetus because she feels like it's going to have muscular dystrophy or something else like that. I don't see any, I don't have any problem with that. And what, to I, clarify, what, what Singer suggests is that we should be able to euthanize babies after they're born. It's not true. about abortion. It's about the euthanasia of several month old babies after they're born. Okay. That's true. So that's a moral question to you and yeah. to Jim, correct? And yes. that's what you teach. But then is, is Johnson an immoral person? Why, why would she be an immoral person? Sorry, Singer. Singer, yes, I think so, yeah. I think he's morally wrong and I think he's pro proposing and promoting views that are morally mistaken. So. In a sense, yeah. I mean, I think if, pe if people promote things that are morally problematic, then in the same way as, I, in my view, abortion should be permissible. I'm kind of, I, I'm opposed to the, the the most recent Supreme Court ruling. And I think the kind of wave of bans on abortion are morally wrong. And I think people who support them, who support sort of a complete ban on abortion, you know, even in cases of rape and incest, are are doing something wrong. Well, the yeah, thing... I mean, but the things that Singer has done are laudable. And, you know, his Wikipedia entry tells all this stuff. So is it like cancel culture? I can't read what he's written. I can't go see him because he's, as you say, immoral. Is he no longer of any value to me? No, no. I mean, I was the part of what I was praising was, was Harriet McBride Johnson engaging with him. Yeah, she did. And she said he was a great guy. Right. So, so I don't think cancel culture has, has anything to do with this. I think she was, I, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure that really how that comes in. I don't know. She had this interview where she said she was Karen Carpenter thin. And I'm thinking, well, that's a horrible thing to say about Karen Carpenter. You know, why'd she say that? That's not a nice thing to say. I don't know. I'm going nowhere. Let's talk about your, uh, your, how your illness, and you talked about it a little bit, but going 
deeper why you thought it was wise and why you thought it was helpful to bring in your experience since I guess you were, would you say 27? I was 27 when I started. Yeah. So I, I, I was 27. I started having um, what later is, is quote, quote, diagnosed as chronic pelvic pain. Although, you know, as diagnoses go, it's pretty much just, yes, you have chronic pain. Yes. It's located in your, in the pelvic region. It's not actually a kind of um, it's not the kind of diagnosis that, um, leads to a treatment. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really give you much to do. I mean, there are various kinds of treatments, but none of them really, really work. And I suppose one of the ways in which I found this led me to, to, to work on the book was the experience of finally finding a doctor, a urologist who said, yeah, this is what's happening. Um, and didn't attempt to, to sort of sell me on a treatment that was hi highly speculative and unlikely to work. And I felt like there was something really helpful in that for that moment of acknowledgement instead of not saying, don't worry, I've got the cure or uh, yeah, he, he, here's a treatment you haven't tried yet, but said, no, I, I acknowledge that this is a very difficult condition to treat that we can try some things, but yeah, this, you're not sort of uh, um, you're not just sort of missing out on some, on some magic solution that you've, you should have found 10 years ago. And there was a kind of insight there that I that really informed my my thinking, and it connects with experiences in my own life where I I, I remember I talk about this in the second person. I imagine the reader having this experience in the book, but you know, unsurprisingly, it's an experience I had myself of having a friend come and talk to me about something they were going through that was very difficult, and immediately sort of switching into the register of um, assurance or advice. So I was telling them uh, it's all going to be fine, or uh, here's what you should do. And realizing that that's a way of just sort of not actually acknowledging that what they're going through is difficult, sort of immediately saying, I, I can figure it out. And that the kind of the breath of acknowledgement of actually trying to, to listen and then trying to describe what's actually happening and sort of figure out what the situation is, is sort of a very important part of trying to cope in um in a humane way with the, the hardships of life. So a lot of what I do in the chapter on, on chronic pain is not proposed sort of magic cures. It's attempt to just describe with a, a, a kind of deeper understanding that I think philosophy can afford us what it, what it means to be in, in pain and what it means for pain to be chronic and why, you know, what that tells us about our relationship to our bodies and to time and why it's so difficult. And I, you know, there's consolation, I think, to be had in that. But I, I think really that kind of description is the the sort of first step to to um, making philosophical progress on on a kind of you know, challenge like de dealing with pain. When when you talk when you talked about people coming up and going, it's going to be fine. My father always said, whenever he had a problem, he goes, everything will work out fine, and it's not the end of the world. Uh -huh. he's, been right. he's been right. Uh -huh. Nothing bad has happened, uh -huh. but I have a friend. Well, it always happens. A friend who, whose son committed suicide, and I see people going up and saying, "Is there anything I can do?" And I've never done that because you can do one of you can do two things. One, you can bring them a casserole, and two, you can bring their son back. Uh -huh. That's the only two things you can do. So there's really no reason to ever do that, but people do it all the time. If yeah. There's, if there's anything I can do, there is not anything you can do. Well, bringing a casserole is not nothing. I mean, I think actually it's, it is meaningful to people when they're it, it, to, to have the sense that other people care and they're trying to ease the everyday yeah. burdens of life. You're much less of a curmudgeon than I am. I see. <laughs> <laughs> you can already, yeah. I mean, bringing a casserole is another good novel title. Uh -huh. <laughs> or, so. <laughs> I can't stop thinking of novel titles. I guess it's also because I'm a bookseller, but here's another one. Uh, everyone, not everyone, all the authors I interview now wrote their book during COVID. And I'm yeah. thinking, oh, act like it's horrible. I'm thinking, well, you're stuck someplace and you can think mm, it's a great time to write a book. And then I'm thinking, this is horrible, but COVID was one of the best times of my life. My wife and family were with me. We took walks in the woods. I knew no one who died. I knew no one who got really sick. I've had COVID twice. I would rather have COVID than a bad hangover. I would rather have COVID than the flu. So 
it sounds kind of sacrilegious. It's not that I don't have empathy for everyone who went through what they did. And like you, you and I both say, we have the luxury of not having two jobs and then all of us and, and no spouse and four kids. It's not, I understand that and I feel that, but all I can, that's the other thing is I can only speak ex experientially as can you with regard to a lot of things. And I don't know where I'm going. Can you say anything? Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I too was extremely lucky in that I was, I wasn't, I don't live on my own. I have my, my wife and my kid around and we get along and I'm not sort of, I don't have, I'm not caring for someone who is in a, like, I'm not, I wasn't left in the position of caring for an aging relative who was dying or, you know, anything like that. And also that most of what I, my, the things that I'm passionate about are relatively solitary pursuits. So yeah, I, I wrote a big chunk of the book during the pandemic the first First few months, I was sort of in a daze in which I couldn't really concentrate. That was when I started the podcast because I wanted to like, do something uh, with my time that was that felt like it would connect with people. But but yeah, I I was extremely fortunate. I mean, I at the same time, I think I, the sense of you know the pervasiveness of people's struggles with loneliness and grief and illness was very you know, was weigh, weighing on me. And I think in a way it weighed on a lot of people who were like you and me, pretty lucky in our own personal experiences. I think it's not like loneliness and, and grief and the frailties of the human body were new pandemic phenomena, but it did suddenly bring into focus just how, you know, fragile and, and disruptable our conditions of life are and how easily we could go into a situation in which, you know, there are, you know, bodies piling up outside hospitals in New York City. That's the, the, the kind of horrifying scenes from early in the pandemic. And so, uh, my microphone out of that. Um, so, I, for me, there was a kind of desire, even though my own situation was relatively enviable. I mean, I'd worked, I'd started writing the book before the pandemic, but I, I think it kind of took a certain kind of urgency during the pandemic to, to try to say something about what philosophy could do about and how it could connect with these kinds of hardships. And then there were more particular things like, you know, the chapter on loneliness. I had been researching this for quite a while and I, I was sort of all set up to debunk the idea that there's an epidemic of loneliness. Like the, the social science is very complicated. Actually, it's not clear that we're really more lonely now than we were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. The history of loneliness, again, very complicated. So I was, I was sort of writing this introduction about how, ah, maybe it's not so bad. And then, you know, the pandemic hits and suddenly you know, a third of the world's population is in lockdown and uh, social isolation is in this is sort of suddenly accelerated. And it seemed, you know, it seemed almost facile to be arguing, well, you know, it's not such a big deal. So it did change some of my relationship to the topics of the book in that way. I guess what I tend to do is I push back against you and lots of philosophers because I guess inherently I don't believe you, or I just think you're wrong. And so it's really hard for me to get past that. For example, your essay on baseball, you know, when you get into the meta statistics and, you know, three out of 10, you fail and yet you're successful. Um, I don't care about sacrifices and bases on balls and errors that are subjective. What I care about is the idea that the hardest thing to do in athletics is hit a baseball. And, and the fact that yeah, the reason why you're failing and succeeding at the same time is because you really can't do any better than do something one third of the time. And I didn't like the way you went away from that. And in my mind, try to justify this idea that it's not failure. It just, it just struck me the, I don't know why it struck me the wrong way. It was like, I felt that you were questioning me. Well, I mean, I do think, so on the one hand, I, I think part of the point there in, in that essay was just that you, there's an immediate flip where you can say, well, man, failure is pervasive because we, we, you know, we, we can only get a base hit even if we're great three out of 10 times. But you could also say, well, man, pitching is so easy. You can, you know, you can, you can get the guy out seven out of 10 times. And so that there's a kind of shift in perspective. But I do think that, I mean, in the chapter on failure in the book, I, 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 yeah. I, I'm very cognizant of the sort of mythologization of failure in baseball. And there are these sort of 
amazing moments of of failure, like you know Bill Buckner letting the ball trickle between his legs, or um, Ralph Branker giving up the shot home around the world. So I do think you know whatever you think about batting averages, this sort of larger sense of baseball as setting up narratives in which we sort of grapple with moments of failure. I do think there's something to that. So I, in that sense, I, I'm not, I wouldn't push back against your, your, your sense of the game. And it, I mean, part of what, what base, why baseball lends itself to that is that it does have this sort of individual on individual character. So it's a team sport, but a lot of it involves, it's very focalized around particular individuals uh, in a way that not all team sports are. So, so yeah, I do think it's a useful, you know, baseball is a great, you know, metaphorical tool for thinking about failure in human life, even if I I think some of the kinds of claims people make about, uh, you know, the, the everyday failure of baseball are, are a bit overblown. Isn't it amazing? I, and I go adrift here, like I always do. Isn't it amazing after all this time that 60 feet, six inches and 90 feet work, that that's a bang, bang play at first base? How can that still be? How is that possible? Well, I wonder, I mean, so the question is whether if there was a different distance, there would just be a different bunch of bang, bang plays. Like there's always going to be some, it, it might be that there's more hits and fewer, you know, more hits or fewer hits if you change the distances, but there'll still be some plays that are, you know, it, it just might be different, different plays and at different ratios. So I, I wonder about that. Yeah. I mean, it, there's this, you know, this sort of early history of baseball in which the, you know, they were constantly toying with the number of balls and strikes and the distance from home play. And I wonder how much different if it felt then, whether, whether it really felt like the sport was not as fine tuned as it is now, because it does still seems to me, even though baseball has a lot of problems with pacing. I mean, the, the slowness of the game is becoming a kind of real. Well, that's why but... you and I like it and kids, I call kid anyone under 30. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's the, most, it's the most boring thing in the world. I know. Oh. But it's the future of baseball feels very precarious when, yeah, when you have the under thirties are not excited about it. Except for the, I mean, you know, there are players under thirty who are astonishing. It's not a, it's not like baseball is in a time when the players are not exciting. In fact, it's the time of Shohei Otani and Mike Trout and Aaron Judge and like it's incredibly gifted baseball players. So. um it would be nice if there's a way to, to, to repackage it so that more people can appreciate that. You're right about the history because you can watch someone steal second in such an amazing fashion and slide so perfectly and then pop right up. And then you watch the old black and white films of Babe Ruth hitting a home run and he's this big, heavy yeah, 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 yeah. guy who's drunk and he just lumbers towards first base. Yeah. It's, completely different thing but that's also part of the beauty of baseball and this this is changing a bit now everyone is in such great shape but when i first became a baseball fan i grew up in england i became a baseball fan in the late late 90s and i was to my shame a yankees fan but it was the period when uh, david wells was a yankee and one of the things i loved about baseball was the sense that these guys you know david wells was not physically in peak condition uh, as it were but he was so great. He was so good. And there was sort of the, det the, the, the kind of vision of the kind of democratic illusion that you can be uh, any body shape you like and still be a great baseball player was part of what, what really attracted me to it. Well, the other story for me is Derek Jeter, especially his last at bat. But he didn't have to dive into the stands after that. He made yeah. enough money. He didn't have to do what he did. He could have ruined his entire life and career, but he can't help it. Yeah. You just can't help it. You he couldn't help always doing as much as he possibly could, and that's the other thing about baseball. Yeah, no, they're they're, and he was one of the you know the last players who really was identified with the team his whole career, which is the thing that again you know I, it's 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 painful when when players sort of leave and you feel like these associations are broken. So I'm I'm not really a Red Sox fan, but I do feel for the. Red Sox fans about Mookie Betts leaving that like he should have been the sort of franchise player forever and yeah no it's it's hard whereas Jeter really lived that out well it's like you're talking about life being hard I was in Boston after they had won the series improbably oh, yeah. and they had also won the Super Bowl I've never been in a place where people were happier and nicer just yeah. because <laughs> I, I felt yeah. like I was in heaven yeah
I, I was not here yet then, sadly. So I, I, I watched it on TV and uh, it was it was a miracle. <laughs> oh, see, you're as a philosopher, you're <laughs> calling it a miracle. <laughs> That's how it felt. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, it's, um, you know, we've gotten away from trying to sell you. <laughs> That's true. But uh, I will do this as we're closing. Um, so the chapters are infirmity, loneliness, uh, grief, failure, injustice, and absurdity. And obviously, from knowing me as little as you do, absurdity is my favorite one. Uh -huh. <laughs> and why did you choose that? Because, and then, yeah, we will end it with this, I think, yeah. whether you like it or not. Um, why is absurdity part of your precept with regard to life being hard? Well, I, th I do think this sort of the sense of meaninglessness, the sense that somehow what does it all add up to in the end is while it's not as, as in some ways urgent a form of hardship as, you know, I'm in pain or, you know, I, I've been deported and I don't have a job. Like there are, there are things that you have to deal with right now. So it, it has a kind of luxury quality to it. But nevertheless, I think it, it is a, a kind of challenge that life faces people with. And I do think there are fruitful things that philosophy can say about it. So I don't know whether, you know, the, the, the book ends by proposing a kind of account of how it could be that life has meaning, right? what it would mean for life have mean, to have meaning that has to do with the idea that there's a way to tell the story of humanity and the place of humanity in the cosmos in which we can affirm what's happening. We can feel like, well, if humanity ends that way, that will be okay. And whether it does or not kind of depends on us. And so there's also a connection between the kind of demands of justice. There's a chapter on injustice and the demand to try and sort of change the course of human history, sort of bend the arc of, of human history towards justice and this idea of life's meaning and sort of overcoming absurdity. Because I think one of the central ways in which we can overcome absurdity is to try to sort of shape human history. And in a way, what I mean is the human future in a way that sort of, tells a story that we can actually be okay with. And so I, it's, I think, a challenge in its own right, a kind of spiritual hardship, but it also connects with other hardships, like the, the kind of challenge of facing up to the injustice of the world, you know, watching the, the stream of terrible news and thinking, what can I do about this? And what should I do about this that, that I think a lot of us are also grappling with right now? Well, yeah, and I guess lastly would be the fact that, and I don't know how you can um, meld this with your being a philosopher, but you went through the same thing. I don't know if it was the same time as midlife, but you went through a period of time where you go, what's the point? Yes. Yeah. You amplify that, but basically it was, what's the point? Right. No, exactly. And I mean, that was the point at which I started trying to think through what I was going through philosophically and then thinking, okay, these seem like questions philosophers should be addressing maybe I need to do that. And then that was sort of the beginning of writing philosophy for, for sort of a non-academic audience. Yeah, which is exactly what the book is about. Someone feels that way. Okay, that's it. The, I'm just realizing that. The book is about you feel that way and then you step away. Well, you have to step away though, don't you? You have to step away. I mean, there's a sort of period of reflection and sort of, yeah, I think there's sort of the gap between feeling this way and writing the book, there was a sort of a, a period of, of trying to figure out if philosophy could help in any way. And yeah, no, I think that's right. Yeah, I think, and that, I think that's a good way to end. I think <clears throat> even though I was kind of mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think a good way to end is by saying that the idea of the book, which I've just comprehended um, after reading it, is that if you feel a certain way, if life is hard for a certain way, the concept of which I would have poo-pooed before, the concept of looking at things in a philosophical manner can actually move you forward or negate some of the pain that you're going through. Is that pretty much it? I hope that's true. Yes, that's the hope. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Karen, for joining us today. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you.